Hi, this is uh, Dr. Duncan Ferguson of the University of Illinois and Vet Med Academy. I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators uh, from the Veterinary Educators and Pharmacology Special Interest Group, Drs. Normandy, Vendrick, Villar, and Chambers, uh, for without their help, this project would not have been possible. In this series, we hope to introduce you to uh, basically the drug regulations that you might expect to see around key parts of the world. And uh, in doing so, we're going to um, go have our guests from VEBSIG, basically faculty members from universities in Great Britain, Holland, Colombia, and South America, and New Zealand. And in this uh, project, we'll divide our attention um, logically between companion animals and food animals. And in doing so, we're gonna to try to highlight the differences uh, that you'd expect in any, any given country and region in the management of uh, companion animals versus food animals with regards to drug regulations. At the end of each section, I'll summarize what we've highlighted during the discussion. And um, this first section is gonna be on companion animal drug regulation and practice issues uh, around drugs. I hope you enjoy it. Well, Dr. Ormandy, thank you for joining us. And uh, 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 we're gonna be discussing the uh, regulatory issues around the use of veterinary pharmaceuticals uh, in the, around the world. And I wondered if you'd tell us a little bit about yourself uh, so we can get an idea where you are and, and how you got to where you, where you are right now. Uh, th thank you very much, Duncan. So um, I'm Emma. I am a lecturer in professional and clinical skills at the University of Liverpool. Uh, I graduated from uh, Glasgow Vet School in 2008 and then was in small animal practice for a few years until I mo moved to uh, Liverpool University to do my master's and my PhD, which was on antimicrobial resistance. And then quickly from a PhD, I joined the teaching staff at Liverpool in my current role. Yes, I'm, an, um, I'm a veterinarian. I also still work as an equine uh, certified practitioner, mainly in weekends and nights. But the main uh, job I have now is, a, is an assistant professor in veterinary pharmacology and toxicology. And I, I did my, uh, my PhD uh, projects also in pharmacology and I specialized, so I'm a a member of the European College of Veterinary Pharmacology and Toxicology as well. Uh, and I work now mainly in uh, teaching and do some research as well in our department. Um, so involved in the whole, in the entire cur curriculum. Um, perhaps relevant for this is that for, for, with regard to antimicrobial use, I am uh, also involved in, uh, in national guidelines for practitioners, so in several, so for, for horses, for uh, dairy cattle, for veal calves, uh, for small ruminants, so sheep and goats. Well, uh, my uh, background is uh, basically uh, uh, as a toxicologist, I did my uh, residency at Iowa State, and then my, uh, I, I, that was uh, almost 20 years ago, so even though I still keep in touch with, with these uh, guys, you know, it's not, I'm not really working as a diagnostician as I was there. Uh, here in, uh, I've been in Colombia for about thir uh, 13 years now. And uh, for the most part, I've been teaching uh, both uh, pharmacology and toxicology. And uh, I, I've, uh, along the way, I have uh, uh, worked uh, in many uh, tropical uh, diseases, if you like, in cattle, uh, the cattle fever tick. I've done a lot of work on that. And uh, lately we've been uh, ex ex uh, uh, exploring uh, what's going on in antimicrobial resistance, which is a huge problem, not, not only in, in Colombia, but I think every, everywhere in the world. So yeah, I'm in um, Massey University in Palmerston North in New Zealand. Um, I'm originally a British graduate at Bristol University. 
<clears throat> went out and practiced for a few years, various large animal, small animal practice, and then went back to Cambridge University to be an anaesthetist. And I got interested in the pharmacology of anaesthetics and analgesic drugs. So I went back to Bristol to do a PhD. And when I finished my PhD, I worked for a while as a lecturer in Bristol and then came out to Massey as a pharmacologist. So the moment I do one day a week anaesthesia and the rest of the time pharmacology. Now, as you can imagine, New Zealand's a pretty small country, so the uh, uh, veterinary pharmacologists are pretty thin on the ground. <clears throat> so I have to be a, a jack of all trades pharmacologist rather than just um, analgesic drugs. But most of my research is in analgesics. Uh, but I'm also on various um, official committees like uh, antibiotic resistance committees and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> Basically, everyone in New Zealand knows everyone else at a, an official level. So it's a lot of stuff is done informally. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to do is to, to look at both the companion animal and the food animal yeah. side of things and see if we could, through examples, elicit uh, how a veterinarian might be more or less constrained by the use of their uh, veterinary pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And the first clinical scenario I wanted to talk about was a, a, a dog, let's just say it's a seven-year-old uh, miniature poodle with refractory epilepsy. And so to start with, what would drugs in your country or jurisdiction um, in the UK, I guess, at this point would be, what drugs would be allowed to be used um, for starts? So, so there's three uh, licensed or authorized drugs for treatment of epilepsy in dogs, phenobarbitone, um, potassium bromide, um, it's sodium bromide in, in other countries, but potassium bromide for us. And, Emepitoin um, is also authorized. Um, Emepitoin is only authorized as a monotherapy. Uh, potassium bromide is only authorized in conjunction with um, phenobarbitone treatment, so not as a monotherapy here. Yeah, and, uh, in the US, we hadn't seen it, but Emepitoin until uh, recently it was recently approved. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so I personally have very little experience with it, so, mm -hmm. but it's like, Diphenylhydantone, the same kind of class of drugs and interacts with benzodiazepine receptors. Yes, yeah. Um, so if you uh, go down the, you know, that list and uh, one of the first line drugs that you mentioned was phenobarbital. Yes. If that drug as a monotherapy is ineffective, what, what generally do you see and what are, what's allowed and what's sort of the process that has and decision-making that a pharmaceutical agent is chosen in this situation for companion animals? So, so um, within companion animals uh, in the UK and in food producing animals, we have um, the cascade. So it, any authorized product has to be used before we would move to a non-authorized product. So in the case that um, monotherapy had been started with phenobarbitone, um, commonly it would then be potassium bromide that could be added to that. Um, if it was then refractory, we could consider other drugs. Um, if you're working, going to consider adding something like emepitoin in, that would then be off license um, because it's not being used as a monotherapy in that case. Um, so therefore you'd be using it under the cascade. So not strictly what it was authorized for. So that kind of take it, taking step down in the cascade uh, what we say is there should be, we should be using an authorized product for indicated in the species and condition in Great Britain or UK wide. Obviously, emetitoin is authorized there, but only as a monotherapy. So um, it would be stepping down the cascade to a veterinary medicine authorized in the Great, in Great Britain, Northern Ireland or throughout the UK. Um, kind of for the same, you can either do it for another species for the same condition or a different condition in the same species, but it would come under that loop there because it's slightly different instructions on how you would you should be giving it. So you would just have to stay, take that step down. And obviously it's really, really important if you're doing anything like this, um, you're getting client consent for that. Clients should be aware that you're using something off license. Um, yeah, in that regard, I was looking at, uh, there was a systemic review of, uh, in fact, from U UK and I think EU, Germany, um, of 
the anti-epileptic drugs, and they sort of showed it at all the drugs you mentioned so far, phenobarb, amipitoin, bromide, and then down the list, um, levetiracetam, um, zonisamide, and other drugs. Yeah. So you're so, talking so about one... the latter two, for example, would be um, their, whether they're used doesn't mean they're approved, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, basically, the, as I say, the order we've got to use, and they should be within the U we have to split the UK currently into Great Britain and Northern Ireland because Brexit has done right. that to us and there are slightly different rules for each. Um, but for within Great Britain, um, if, if you don't have an authorised product, then you should look for a product that's authorised in Northern Ireland for the species and condition. Um, if not, then you're looking either UK wide or in Great Britain or Northern Ireland separately that it's authorised for a different condition in the same species or the same condition in a different species. If you can't do that, that's when we can move on to those other drugs, the human drugs. Um, so those are authorized in humans, so they would just be that next step down. Um, Zanizamide, uh, Levitrastam. Um, those are the ones that would come after those first three. We're always and, and, gonna use. Okay. And, and so the key to using those drugs that are um, off label uh, or not on that list would be approval of the owners that they recognize it's, it's yeah. extra label use. Um, yes. And, and probably making sure that, you know, you have good records, record keeping in case something yeah, happens. Yeah, right. exactly. I always tend to say to our students, you get consent forms from people, but it's not the consent form that shows that you've got informed consent. It's a conversation that you have and your clinical records that really Record, detail it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you think of any other practical or regulatory limits regarding what uh, this particular use application? Yeah, I mean, I mean, other things to think about are obviously if there's other conditions um, that are going on that are contraindicated, for sure. example, being a barbitone and hepatic disease, um, you know, it's a, because it induces cytochrome P450, um, there is increased risk of hepatic injury with that drug. So I think just making sure before you start an animal on a drug, because that's what is authorized, just make sure there's no contraindications there um, yeah. with other conditions, um, for sure. Good medicine, good pharmacology. Yes, uh, exactly, exactly. I, I think that's a, a really important thing for students as well is don't just read the dosage on the data sheet. When you're looking at a data sheet, please do read it all. There's a reason why all that information is there for you. Um, and in the UK, we have um, the Veterinary Medicines Director. I have an online database. I'm sure it's very similar in the US um, yes. of all the authorised drugs. And that's the most up to date place to be looking for any changes. Um, so if you're ever unsure, um, go there. And, and that's really helpful. Right. Great. Um, you mentioned the difference between just Northern Ireland and, uh, and the main island i guess <laughs> yeah. um you basically eu and what's what hap what's happened with brexit can you generalize some things that are making this complicated right now and how where do you see it going oh i i think at the moment it's, it's all moving and i think uh, a lot of some things um northern ireland still is following the eu um so when we talk about uh, food producing and food producing animals there's a list there um, I would say at the moment, at calling it, there's a lot of debates in Parliament at the moment, and I think trying to call what's going to happen is really difficult. I would just say currently for prescribing, it is just slightly different. Um, if you're going to be using a medicine, for example, um, that isn't authorised in, in this case, dogs in Great Britain, Northern Ireland or UK wide, um, you then move to uh, human medicine in the UK, but for Northern Ireland, um, you could do, it must be from another EU member state that you'd, you'd have to choose like a, a drug for animals. So um, there's more specifics in some ways for Northern Ireland because they are still following some of the EU rules. I think we have uh, three registered drugs for this indication. The one, the one we start normally is uh, phenobarbital. Um, so I don't know 
if we have to get into doses regimens and such, but that's no, where we're just we start. No, we're basically looking at the, the types of drugs. Yeah. Yeah. And of course you need some time to, to stabilize uh, the concentrations to get the right dose. But then in the end, well, when it works, it works. When it doesn't work, you could add potassium bro uh, bromide uh, to the phenobarbital. And that's well, a bit variable, the results with that. Uh, and the third we have, if that's not successful, we have, um, uh, as called, uh, imipetorine, so the partial uh, 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 agonist, right? And that's relatively new, and that's, well, expensive, but it has a lot of advantages in, in, with regard to side effects, of course. Uh, that's the main, the first line treatment of epilepsy, I think. And then we have, of course, some benzodiazepines to to or other GABA or pharmaca to, to, to give when you have a really a, a bad seizure, but it's not a for longer duration. Um, so these, the these three would these three would be accept or any, yeah. and, and with the adjunct of the benzodiazepines would be accepted um, as a sort of a, the tier of drugs that would be chosen first uh, from stand, standpoint of practice and regula yep. regulatory medicine. Would Yvette, say if a jet, Yvette decided, well, we can get into that in the next step when things aren't working. What So what it would happen uh, if this drug with, with say phenobarb and potassium bromide were not effective and you had to go down the list to drugs that um, were human drugs? Uh, what would yeah. a veterinarian in the EU uh, be allowed to do? Well, you in this scenario, you would be, uh, I think you would be allowed quite a lot. I'm not sure which specific drugs you're talking about, but if it, it isn't a problem to, to give the drugs to an owner, if it, that doesn't have the risk of, for instance, the owner taking it himself or abuse or uh, that kind of things. Of course, uh, we have to think about that, but I'm not sure that's for uh, anti-epilepsy uh, drugs. It's, that's often not the case, I think. So I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 So we have drugs that, you know, uh, and I'm lo I recently looked at a uh, um, critical review of drugs and they did include the ones, three that you mentioned. Um, this was a 2014 study out, yeah. of, uh, out of the EU, uh, including I think Germany and, and Britain. Uh, at the time they were in the EU. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, you go down from there, they had others like zonisamide and you could get into, uh, some people would use other other drugs. Um, yeah, but Penton even, you know, where would the, uh, where would the scrutiny come in from, a, from the standpoint of regulation, regulatory practice? Uh, yeah, that's a good a question. In, I think- For a vet in the Netherlands. That's not that really, be? yeah. That's not really arranged really well, I think. Okay. Uh, for some, for, yeah, for for some drugs, well, it is like opioids. Those are more uh, restricted by law. Right. But uh, gabapentin, for instance, uh, well, I think a lot of small animal practitioners use gabapentin in uh, dogs and cats for several indications, and right. that's. Well, it's allowed if you have a good argumentation. Right. So the, the we point have a, is... The cascade, the, right. the cascade uh, is in law. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's quite logical. Yes. yes. No? It's a step. Uh, it's, it's logical. And the, uh, human medicine are also a possibility when you have the argumentation. Yeah. Right. And then you have to have the documentation, right? And then you have mm -hmm. to have the uh, veterinary patient uh, client agreements in place. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's um, yeah. Are there so from this from a practical or regulatory standpoint, there's there are no there's the cascade, but then there are no real limits as long as you can make a case that it's a bet it's good practice if you see it in yeah. the literature, et cetera. Yeah. And okay. you should be well, there should be no risks or for the owner who gives the medication. Uh, exactly. so either uh, with regard to abuse or, uh, well, side effects or risks for the owner, of course, but I don't think that's the case here. 
Well, it, uh, I think it, it might be different uh, here than it is in other places, but uh, phenol, phenobarbital is, you know, is the one that uh, uh, most uh, veterinarians will probably uh, use as a fir first line of therapy. Uh, it can be acquired through a narcotic, uh, well, uh, through the National Narcotic Agency, uh, which is uh, basically uh, the one regulating all the controlled substances. Uh, phenobarb is one of those uh, controlled substances. So basically what the veterinarian needs is to uh, purchase a prescription pad. And uh, then there's... Uh, uh, kind of pharmacies that uh, are only authorized to sell those uh, control substances. Now, having said that, the you know the the truth of the matter is what, or the reality is, is quite different. I was uh, uh, kind of uh, interviewing a, a couple of veterinarians, and they say that uh, probably about eighty to ninety percent of uh, uh, Control substances are uh, attained through the through a black black market, if you want to call it some way. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a murky murky business, you know. You probably don't want to go around uh, poking uh, too too much because, um, mm -hmm. uh, as I say, it's it's all kind of a, it's probably a, a mafia like business in, mm -hmm. in some ways. So basically, uh, all those uh, all the drugs that uh, are um, controlled substances uh, it, that includes uh, phenobarb, we have ketam ketamine, propofol, uh, opioids. Uh, as I say, there I was uh, chatting with, with one of the suppliers, and he says that uh, most of them are coming from Chile these days. And again, you know, it's kind of a win-win situation for everybody here. The veterinarians get those drugs uh, twice or three times cheaper, then you have 50% uh, uh, of the population which is informal uh, jobs. So there are probably a lot of, a lot of uh, vendors or suppliers that you know are uh, taking advantage of that. Uh, and uh, uh, the regulatory agencies, you know, they probably, probably look, you know, the other way. They don't really want to get you, they don't really want to crack down on that business. So let's go on to the next phase of this, Annette. Let's say that that uh, animal is re is not responding well to phenobarb, and you need to get into other drugs. Um, what, what first of all, what drugs would be available? How would they get them? You know, what, what do you think would happen there? I, I was checking with, uh, as I say, a, a few veterinarians that uh, I I was uh, I work with. Uh, because they're interested on, on doing some research. And they say that uh, most of the uh, other drugs that you might use uh, can be easily attained uh, through most uh, pharmacies. So which ones would those be? Uh, potassium bromide, uh, Kepra. Teracetam, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. gavaline, uh, gabapentin. Uh, so uh, if you want to use those as an adjunct, you know, to phenobar, uh, you you can find those easier easier uh, than than uh, phenobar. So yeah, and when I yeah when I visited South America and actually Colombia, um, you you know you notice pharmacies in a lot of different corn a lot of places. There's a lot of small pharmacies, um, so that that's um, presumably where they get where they go to at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so would there be any practical, what are the most common practical reasons for going beyond what we just talked about uh, or even going to that level for veterinarians in Colombia? Is it cost? Is it regulations? You know, uh, availability of drugs? What do you think? Yeah, well, probably most uh, veterinarians don't, don't want to go through the hassle of, uh, you know, registering with the uh, uh, National Narcotic Agency. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to pay it for the, you know, for uh, the prescription pad or notebook, whatever you want to, uh, mm -hmm. it's called. Uh, and as I say, you know, they can get the, the 
control substances for a much lower price than if they go through the legal legal uh, route. So okay. they say there are no really regulatory limits uh, because everything is kind of, you know. Uh, so you don't think the enforcement, there's not enforcement uh, no. to, that you've been able to discern. No, okay, the, the that's obviously an issue. To, yeah, the veterinarians they talked to, they didn't say that, uh, you know, the, the regulatory agency, uh, you know, is really, it, it doesn't show up to the veterinarian. To, to the clinics. Yeah. So um, you want to give us an overview of you know, how the regulatory scene looks, uh, say, compared to what you know about the rest of what, say, UK, for example, yeah. or, or EU? Yeah, the um, New Zealand has got uh, some strange quirks here. Um, so basically, the human medicine scene is uh, almost entirely cut and paste from the British legislation. So the the Medicines Act and the Misuse of Drugs Act are very, very similar to British before EU days. Veterinary medicines are controlled under a separate act, which um, wasn't really thought through at the time. So there's a lot of uh, grey areas and a lot of areas where people make policy. Now, the vets in New Zealand are regulated by the Veterinary Council, and they've got a very comprehensive um, bit in their guide to professional conduct which sets out the expectations for vets and that fills in a lot of the gaps in the law. So basically the law is pretty permissive um, as long as vets, it relies on vets using their discretion to do things properly. So in the United States, for example, it, it, as long as there's an identified on, on a particular companion animal basis, there's the veterinary patient client relationship uh, in there uh, veterinarian has some leeway is what you're indicating with regards to yeah. making best evidence decisions. Yeah, so the the animal has to be under the care of the, uh, the vet. <clears throat> and that for commanding animal, that would mean uh, having seen the animal, done an examination and made a decision about what the best treatment is. Now, the best treatment is left pretty well up to the vet. There are some guidelines, but they're fairly vague and vets can overrule them if they've got a good excuse. So for instance, um, the more likely there is to be a problem, um, for instance, not to use some reserved antibiotics or something like that, you'd have to have a very good justification. But as long as you've got that justification, you can do it. Now that's actually, uh, vets have more leeway in New Zealand than uh, human general practitioners have. So right. they have to refer those sort of cases to an infectious diseases uh, specialist in the hospital. Whereas vets can just um, try and obtain the drugs and give them to the animals if they can justify it. Right. It sounds more like the United States from the standpoint of the, <clears throat> the freedom to make the decision if you can provide the evidence or you can show. It, it doesn't even have to be the kind of evidence that you and I as pharmacologists sometimes accept. It just simply has to be out there and being used by, you know, you can demonstrate it's being used. Um, that seems a, in distinction is what we heard from our colleague in the uh, UK, for example, where there's a, there's a hierarchy of uh, choices uh, for yes. certain indications. Uh, we've got a, a watered-down version of the Cascade system, um, but it's, it's much more open, so a lot more is left to the vet's discretion in our version. Okay. Well, let's talk about the specific scenarios uh, that I forwarded to you. Uh, the first being a small animal one, which is sort of a, initially starts as a routine treatment of a uh, uh, seven-year-old miniature poodle with uh, epilepsy. Well, uh, get, again, most vets would not start at the, uh, the best place <clears throat> from a legal yeah. point of view. So the, there are really only two um, anticonvulsants registered for veterinary use in New Zealand. That's uh, amepitone and diazepam. Now, obviously, um, diazepam wouldn't be suitable for chronic use. Now, amepitone is very expensive here. So most vets will actually use human phenobarb off-label. Um, it's the cascade system says if there is a veterinary product available which meets the animal's treatment needs, then vets should use it, but it doesn't insist that vets have to use it. So um, as long as vets can come up with a reason why they should use uh, phenobarb rather than methadone, 
they're not allowed to just say it's cheaper, so I'm going to use it because it's cheaper. So they've got some sort of scientific reason. Uh, and um, as I said, most animals would probably start off on phenobarb and then get uh, put onto an epitone if the phenobarb doesn't work properly. So let's say this animal has some uh, refract as a refractory condition. What where does a veterinarian where are they allowed to go in terms of choosing drugs that aren't on the those two amongst those two? Um, well, all of the other ones um, are human drugs. So the um, there's a fair selection in New Zealand. The current trendy one at uh, Massey is um, the veteracetam. <clears throat> It's quite expensive, and um, again, it's it's basically a human drug being used off label. Now, the Medicines Act here allows vets to prescribe human drugs for animals under their care, so it's not a huge problem. Um, but as I say, the the Veterinary Council says we should apply the cascade. But if the animal hasn't responded to uh, a mevatolin properly, then vets can pretty well do what they want. Now, some vets will use bromide as well, but bromide is not available um, either in human or veterinary form. So vets have to compound it themselves, which raises a whole other legal questions. So a brief summary of the drug regulations for companion animal medicine uh, around these selected countries around the world. The UK regulations uh, prescribe specific and comprehensive cascade of approved drugs that are allowed for use. And then allow drugs approved for same species, different condition, or different species, same condition, before moving on to what they consider broader extra label use. The European Union requires veterinary approved drugs first within the country, then a choice is possible from veterinary approved drugs in other EU countries before off label use, which has to be highly documented. In New Zealand, the cascade system is a little looser with veterinary drug acts outlining um, something looser than the than, uh, United Kingdom, allowing best evidence justification of off-label use of human drugs. And in Colombia, the veterinary drug use is less restricted by enforcement and impacted by the common extra legal practice of importation of veterinary drugs from other countries.